Okay. Um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people in this room about the Baltics. I think it wouldn't have been the case 15 years ago. Uh, it's a sign of the great interest that the region is now triggering in France. And I think it's also a good illustration of what Europe is. Um, as you all know, France doesn't have access to the Baltic Sea. But in Europe, your sea is my sea, your neighbor is also my problem. Uh, so it's, uh, it's great to, to see so many people here uh, for, this, uh, for this debate and this, uh, and this panel. If I think uh, of the history of this place, the École Militaire, I think it must have been a century that we don't uh, speak Baltics so much, because last time that France was very much involved in the Baltics, it had a link uh, with Lithuania, by the way, it was when the French, uh, after the First World War, were given the keep of the Lithuanian city of Klaipeda for four years. And uh, after that, um, in 1923, we were pushed away, to say it uh, nicely, by the Lithuanian. And I think it should have triggered quite an emergency meeting here at the École Militaire. But that was the last time. And, uh, and it's, great, it's great to be back in a much in a much nicer context to discuss about this topic. Uh, we are very lucky to have this panel today. Um, if I count well, there are something like nine or 10 countries around the Baltic Sea, but uh, quite a big number are, are present with us today, and we are, and we are lucky for that. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Mrs. Tuchkoutier, um, I hope I pronounce your name uh, well, um, um, La Basse Dienas. Uh, you are um, Deputy Minister for National Defense uh, in Lithuania. And among your main responsibilities, there are the national defense system and, the pol um, and policy making and coordination of, of cyber uh, security. We are also lucky to have Anna Oyanen. Um, uh, welcome here in Paris. Uh, you are a research director and also a professor um, at, uh, at university in Finland a good expert of the, of the region, and also you won't have a chance to listen to that, but a great French speaker. Uh, uh, we had uh, the occasion to speak before the, before the, um, the start of the, of the panel. Uh, Bart Cote is also with us. Uh, um, you are the Deputy Program Director of the Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, I understand that uh, some of my uh, colleagues at the Ecole Militaire visited your forum last year with, uh, to see uh, how great it is, uh, and we are very uh, lucky to have you, uh, because I think running this forum, you have a very good perspective of the security of the region, and also this will be part of my questions later, but Poland, of course, is very much a Central European country as, as, as a Baltic country, both of them, so I think it gives a, a, a kind of a different perspective, and we are, uh, and we are uh, waiting to listen um, about that. Uh, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Felt uh, is with us. I think we can't have a debate about the Baltic Sea without some Navy involved. Uh, and you are, uh, uh, of course, uh, well known as, as um, a great leader uh, of the German uh, Navy for, for a long time. You were Deputy Chief of Staff for Operation and Logistics uh, at NATO uh, for, for, for a long time and uh, also a commander of the military district, uh, and I understand it was uh, covering uh, partly the Baltic Sea. And last but not least, uh, uh, we have also Patrick de Rousier uh, with us. Uh, you have a long career that brings you in Brussels for a long time, uh, up to the cabinet of um, Federica Mogherini. Uh, and uh, you said just before that coming to Brussels was a bit your introduction to the northern part of Europe. Uh, you are also a great uh, uh, connoisseur of the, of the Baltic Sea and the Baltic States, and uh, it will be, uh, of course, a very interesting contribution. So today we will discuss two sets of challenges. Uh, of course, the security situation in the region changed dramatically in the past 15 years. Uh, to name just a few challenges, it's about energy, it's about environment, it's about, of course, military issues, uh, very um, recently, we also discovered that it could be uh, migration issues, and we were more uh, used to have migration issues in the Mediterranean Sea, but we see that it can be used uh, by foreign powers to put pressure on Europe in the, in the Baltic Sea region. 
um, and we will also try to address the challenges ahead. So I will start by asking you, uh, all of you the same question uh, and give you the floor for seven to ten minutes. Uh, in the context of NATO enlargement to the region, what unites today the country bordering the Baltic Sea and what challenges do they have to face together? And we, I will give the floor first to, to the Minister of Lithuania. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, really, I, I always enjoy to, to be a part of uh, these kind of formats where we can uh, elaborate and speak about, uh, about the Baltic Sea region, about uh, how it is plugging in the context of the EU and NATO, and uh, how we view ourselves uh, in this uh, challenging and changing world. So let me start with the, uh, also with the saying uh, my gratitude to the organizers that uh, in France uh, it's being taken into account what is happening somewhere in the north of Europe. Uh, when, whereas uh, some time ago maybe it was not that uh, much the case and uh, not that much of the concern. So I think uh, uh, it's positive that... Uh, we are putting much more attention towards different uh, geographical perspectives because we understand that, uh, as you said, uh, uh, my sea is your sea and uh, your problem is my problem as well because we are too much interconnected. Uh, and uh, we start to understand that uh, something that is ha happening just uh, behind the eastern border, it can be touching us uh, very much directly. Uh, so, so let me start with a couple of uh, things uh, for the beginning. First of all, I think uh, Baltic Sea region, uh, what is uniting us uh, among each other in the Baltic Sea region, that we very much have uh, a very similar and the same threat perception. And we used to have it from the very beginning. It didn't uh, arrive with uh, uh, the war happening in Ukraine. But we used to have it from the very, very long historical uh, common experience. Because uh, we know Russia very well. And uh, we know what happens uh, when you try to make a deal with Russia. In uh, any case, uh, you are losing in the end. So, <laughs> so there should not be any illusion that... Uh, Russia can be a pragmatic, uh, good partner uh, with which you can have a, a, a mutually uh, beneficial uh, outcome in the end of your cooperation. Because whenever we try to, to approach Russia in this way, we, we had very bad experience by, by losing some of the territory, by having people deported uh, to Siberia, by uh, having uh, uh, the suppression regime in the country. That's why uh, countries uh, that are especially closer to the Russian border, they have a very strong uh, understanding who is the enemy and who is uh, the partner and the ally. So in the, in the consequence of that, uh, of uh, very uh, alerted uh, threat per perception, we have... Uh, I think uh, we are the ones who are the first ones uh, investing very uh, strongly into our defense. Uh, at this moment, uh, Lithuania is reaching already 2,77% of GDP in, uh, for the defense uh, budget. Our neighbors, such as uh, Estonia, I think it's reaching already 3%, if I'm not mistaken. And Latvia is also uh, strongly above uh, 2%. Poland is a good example as well because Poland is uh, is a leader, I would say, in the region uh, that is uh, showing uh, how and uh, and uh, the scale of the investment into into the defense. And um, I think what is also important is that uh, uh, although we are competing in certain areas, like economically in the innovations and uh, and uh, let's say different initiatives in the European Union or in NATO. But when it comes to the threat perception, 
uh, finding common language, uh, finding uh, common grounds and uh, positions in the international formats with our partners, neighbors and allies around the Baltic Sea, we are always uh, finding uh, this language uh, that is uh, very well, uh, uh, I mean, it's not even a big effort to, uh, to, to, to communicate it. Uh, I think Germany is also a very strong partner and uh, a strong messaging uh, through the deployment of the German brigade to Lithuania. It's something very significant that is showing that uh, also the uh, quite distant uh, neighbor uh, is uh, showing the intentions to be present uh, in the uh, Lithuania in the Allies territory in order to to show that uh, the security is not anymore only a matter and business of uh, certain country is uh, the security is uh, is a matter of our collective understanding and uh, collective uh, approach to, uh, towards that uh, that uh, uh, strategy uh, I think uh, what is happening in France is also very p positive, I would say, because I can see a changing narrative in the public uh, uh, domain. Uh, before the war in Ukraine, we, we used to hear quite many uh, messages that uh, it's possible to have uh, lines, uh, channels of communication opened with Russia, and uh, we should find some uh, common grounds uh, in understanding how to deal with the Crimean situation, etc. But at this moment, I can see that uh, there is uh, also a clear understanding that uh, Europe needs to invest into defense. France needs to be a leader in, in Europe. France needs to, to also show the interest uh, in the further distant geographical points. And uh, in this way, I think it's, uh, this is how we can find uh, more unity and uh, solidarity among each other. So uh, let's hope that uh, our efforts will be quick enough, generating uh, quick enough effect, because uh, the time is very expensive. And uh, two years of the war already going on, and... Uh, there is no victory of Ukraine. And uh, the victory of Ukraine can be reached only if we invest in enough, quickly, and, uh, and we do everything what is possible. Because the cost would be much higher if we don't do this now. Because uh, if... Uh, I'm afraid to say, as quite many experts saying, but the history tends to repeat. So if we do not uh, suppress the aggressors' ambitions right now, afterwards they might come back with uh, much uh, worse effect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as, as you referred to Poland at the end of your speech, maybe I will uh, give the floor to our Polish friend now. Um, yes, indeed. Um, thank you, of course, also not only for being here, which is great, actually, that uh, the Polish voice is here in France and that we could actually speak about also the strategic um, approach towards the, the security in Europe, which is, uh, which is a refreshing uh, perspective also from the Polish side that the, that the discussion about the imminent threat from, uh, from Russia um, unfortunately, because of the war of Ukraine, in Ukraine, but but still uh, is not there only in the Central Eastern Europe, but it has actually also entered the um, the, the the rooms of uh, of Paris, of Berlin, and um, other uh, capitals. Um, you asked a very precise question: what actually uh, uh, what what is our common vision about the security in the Baltic uh, Sea, and uh, what could or divides us right now? When it comes to the uh, common uh, uh, common vision, I guess that starting from the very small things, it is of course an enormous joy that we have two more allies right now in NATO, which is of course Sweden and Finland. 
Uh, but why is this so, actually? Not only because of uh, you know, NATO proving itself to be the most effective and the, most, uh, the best, if I can say it like that, um, alliance that, uh, that existed in, that, in, in Europe for, for, for centuries, but also uh, because Sweden and Finland are coming to the alliance not as the free riders, but as actually allies that uh, that uh, that bring their own very unique capabilities, and that um, that from the day one are not only the benefiters of the security that the NATO gives, but uh, but also the providers to uh, to to the security of the Baltic uh, Sea region, but also to the security of NATO as such. And actually, um, this is the point of view that from the Polish side uh, is uh, is very important that, that we should actually underline. Uh, and this is also uh, what stands behind, I would say, the, uh, the change that is currently that we are living through uh, from the Polish side when it comes to our approach towards security. So Poland, uh, for years, although of course uh, spending a lot of money on military spending, always being very close to the or over the the, the cap that that, uh, that that we pledged to, uh, right now stepped up. It's over four percent right now of the GDP. We are talking about even reaching 5% in the, in, the next, uh, in, the, in the next year. But it is because we believe that, that Poland um, should become actually the security provider to the region. And it is what we are also asking France, what we are asking other allies that possess unique capabilities, such as, well, France is the best example actually for that, um, to also step up and to consider themselves as, of course, being the security providers also to Central and Eastern Europe. Um, of course, there is a big discussion that we are living through right now. What does the European security stands for uh, and whether Europe can or is capable of defending itself because of, the, uh, of what we are facing right now from, uh, from the internal politics in, in the US. And of course, we can be uh, very frank and, and say that uh, we would not like Trump to be the president once again because of his attitude towards NATO. Uh, but let us actually uh, wait a second and ask ourselves a question whether he's not right on certain issues. Because um, uh, uh, our pledge to this 2% cap uh, is something more than only the military spending. It is also our, uh, a clear example on, on, on what, we, uh, what we promised and what we don't deliver as, as, uh, as the alliance as such. Of course, there are countries that, that, that are spending more than 2%. There are countries that are lagging behind. The question is what, what those countries are showing, what kind of resilience those countries are showing to, uh, to our arch enemy uh, in, in, in the Kremlin. And that is why also in, in Poland we very much welcomed the, the, words, the recent words from uh, President Macron that uh, tried to re-establish some kind of a strategic ambiguity towards, um, uh, to, towards Russia. Because uh, we, uh, we believe that, uh, that we should uh, reconsider taking the strategic initiative, uh, avoiding uh, 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 Russian uh, reflexive control and ourselves to be actually in a trap of self-deterrence. If we do not do so, then we will be, uh, they will be all, always responding to what is uh, or to the messages that are coming from uh, from the Kremlin, and that's where I come over to, to the point what actually may or is actually dividing us right now among the uh, the Baltic Sea uh, countries, uh, but maybe not only the Baltic Sea countries, but the others who are actually looking right now at the um, at the Baltic Sea security, because of course with the uh, with Sweden and with, with Finland entering uh, NATO, there is a lot of discussion whether NATO has become the, uh, the lake, the NATO lake, uh, which I suspect is actually um, to blunt of, the, of, of a statement and uh, that do not actually uh, show the, uh, the, potential, the potential Russian uh, threat that still exists in the Baltic Sea. Um, and that is, uh, I, I listed all those uh, actually elements that we can actually discuss in, in details. But honestly speaking, uh, Russia still possesses the uh, capabilities of uh, threatening military and civilian targets along the Baltic Sea coastline, including the critical infrastructure, conducting covert and overt hybrid attacks and special operations from and in the sea, 
disrupting lives of communication and other sea energy linkages. Um, and the uh, air, naval, and missile armaments uh, of Kaliningrad remains mostly actually intact, despite, despite the fact that a lot of those units were deployed also in, in Ukraine. Um, so the question is, of course, we are talking about the big strategic uh, questions about what should NATO be in the future, how we uh, correspond to the fact that, uh, that uh, the US uh, may not be uh, that eager to engage in the European security. Uh, while at the same time, you know, being very happy with the fact that we that NATO has um, new allies coming to the to the alliance, and that believing that this is the the, the proof that this it is still the very effective uh, uh, alliance, but we should actually very uh, very much and very honestly ask ourselves questions. And this, the first question is if we are um, if if despite the fact that we that we share the same strategic view over. Uh, our arch enemy in the Kremlin, are we really uh, in a possession of the capabilities that uh, are needed to respond to this threat? Um, and I leave you with this question right now, and I hope that we'll uh, have this discussion in details in a second. Thank you. I, I think as you made a number of references to Finland and, and Sweden, maybe I will give the floor to Anna. Um, it's a clear change in, in this region, the accession of Finland and, and Sweden to, to the alliance. Uh, they come also, uh, as Bart, you said, with a very specific profile of countries that never disinvested their, their, their defense. Because, of course, being neutral, you need to be credible at the same time, so you invest in your own defense. So how do you see this change uh, from, from Helsinki? Um, and don't you think, by the way, the fact that uh, Russia is now in a war of aggression in Ukraine. It moved a lot of capabilities down south. So it could have the effect of making the Baltic Sea for a short period of time more secure. Uh, so what it is to enter the, the alliance at this very specific period of time? Thank you. Um it is working. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you for the invitation. It is a great pleasure and an honor to be here on this panel. And thank you also for the, uh, for the questions. Um, yes, um, we already heard the uh, mentioning of the Baltic Sea as a lake. That is perhaps something that we wouldn't use. <laughs> Uh, certainly, the, the Baltic Sea is not an ocean either, but it is big enough, I would say, uh, to have many different countries around it and sometimes uh, also different realities depending on where you look it uh, from. And, by the way, it is also a, um, a sea with many names. We in the north do not call it a Baltic, Baltic state, sorry, Baltic Sea. Uh, we call it the Eastern Sea, uh, which is somewhat funny for us Finns because from seen from Finland, it is to the west and not to the east. But this is just one of the many things we have borrowed from Sweden. So uh, what unites us now, I would start with that and say exactly what uh, the minister was saying. Uh, it is this threat perception that certainly unites us. But um, uh, Philip was alluding to the possibility of uh, things getting somehow uh, also sort of more tranquil in, in, in the region just now. Uh, what I see, I see is that um, in this joint or shared threat perception, we have several new elements that affect us all. Uh, we see new threats to the, um, the underwater infrastructure that connects us, uh, pipelines, uh, cables, um, and this is very uh, a dramatic change that uh, keeps many people busy now. And um, also the, uh, the very important sea connections that we have to keep an eye on. Um, for Finland, certainly, uh, the, the Baltic Sea has always been vital for the uh, transportation of goods. We sometimes say that uh, Finland is an island. 
and functioning sea connections are really of great importance. Um, now, uh, if we think about the Baltic Sea region in terms of cooperation, um, we can see how dramatically things have changed uh, if we compare to the uh, short period after the Cold War, when we uh, were busy building up different co uh, cooperation uh, structures and new sub-regional uh, organizations like the Council of Baltic Sea States. It was a very different reality, and now we see it didn't last long. Now these uh, regional uh, organizations are more or less frozen in the Baltic and the Arctic area. Russia is out. And instead we have um, all kinds of deepened uh, security and defense cooperation arrangements between the other countries of the region. And for Finland, uh, the most important uh, and deep defense cooperation is certainly with Sweden. The um, bilateral cooperation has been deepening for some years already, and it is usually described as cooperation that has no limits, can be actually anything. And it covers uh, times of uh, like peacetime, but also times of crisis and war. And, um, as Finland and Sweden are so fundamentally important for each other in defense, uh, it, it was also very important that both enter NATO. Um, otherwise, it would be a bit strange to have your most important partner on the other side of the NATO border, so to say. And uh, yes, the entrance of Finland and Sweden into NATO changes a lot. Um, from the Finnish perspective, uh, Thinking about defense was already for some time developing from non-alignment towards a defense that is based on cooperation. Um, more and more emphasis was given to bilateral, trilateral, uh, regional um, cooperation. And this has been extending to other Nordic and uh, Baltic uh, countries. But the, the big difference Na between then and now that uh, NATO membership rings is the way we speak about it. Um, now, this cooperation is clearly about defense. Before, we might have cooperated, but we called it exercises and uh, we used other kind of vocabulary. Now, it is about defense. And we see also Sweden, uh, already before it entered NATO, uh, telling very clearly already about it, its intention to send troops to contribute to NATO uh, enhanced forward prisons in Latvia. Very clear signal as well. And in fact, Sweden in many senses is uh, very much uh, the centerpiece of the region um, and no doubt will have an active role. And I'll be happy to uh, deepen later on. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I think it's uh, it's now turn um, it's now time to turn to Germany, um, and I think what is specific about this region and NATO EU is that uh, from a defense point of view, you have to defend, I mean, land, but also sea. So can you tell us a bit more about this sea dimension? Yeah. Thank you very much for having invited me to tell you a little bit about the German situation of the German assessment about the new situation and about our responsibilities, possibilities in the Baltic Sea area before and especially after the accession of Finland and uh, Sweden. I, preach, I appreciate very, very much uh, the French interest in the Baltic. Uh, and you mentioned that this is after a long time, the first time that you are putting your focus on this uh, very strategic region. And if you look to the to the, to the landscape, then you can see there are hot spots. The first is in the Danish Straits, the second is south, uh, west, uh, west of Bornholm, where we have only a very narrow way to navigate due to the water depths. And the third one is uh, between uh, Sweden, now a member of NATO, and uh, the Baltic States, if I may say so. And these three hotspots are still a concern uh, for military, not only for the Navy. 
But uh, I think uh, th there are two things, three things which we have to keep in mind, and this is we need in the Baltic Sea from the maritime perspective a permanent surveillance, attention and military presence. And I say, and I repeat, permanent. And of course, it's not a security problem alone, which makes it even more complicated. The accession of Finland and Sweden has changed the situation for the better. Sweden and Finland, knowledge, expertise and capabilities are reinforcing NATO's additionally to their enhanced geography in the Eastern Baltic. And if you look, if you look uh, from Sweden to Norway, then you can see that there is a new strategic depth for NATO. And this includes, of course, not only the maritime aspect, but Air Force and Army as well. But I do not agree saying that the Baltic Sea is in European Union or NATO Sea. It is an open sea following the definition of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And we must avoid saying the wrong narrative to the public. And we have to keep in mind that Russian ships, that Chinese ships, that Iran ships are allowed to exercise there in this area. This is very crucial if you compare the situation with the eastern part of the world, with the global discussion about what is able and what is makeable and adjustable in the South China Sea. And there is a comparison. We should not forget that. And therefore, the, o the Baltic Sea is an open sea. And we are all witnesses of changes in the Baltic Sea since the end of the Soviet Union, first for the better until 2014, and from there worse and even worst since February 22nd, 2022. Now we are dealing with the third change, which is the accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO. The whole military situation, especially the threat by the Russian aircraft and missiles, has become easier to fight. And anti-access, anti-denial questions and challenges are easier to answer. But an interesting and very important positive perspective is the intensive Nordic cooperation, which has already, which is existing since long years. So it's not new for Sweden and for Finland and for the Baltic states and for Norway and Iceland to work and to cooperate together, even in military means. Now it's an official one, which makes it easier, but it is not new. Due to the threat perception, based on the fact that Russia has two busy naval bases, or better, military bases, at their command, the Kaliningrad Oblast and St. Petersburg, especially the Oblast, is a strong base, equipped with medium and long-range missiles. Russia is threatening all nations bordering the Baltic. They are threatening with conventional, hybrid, and nuclear capabilities. But the Oblast is surrounded by Poland and Lithuania, both equipped with appropriate capabilities to reduce the threat at short notices, and even maybe a little bit faster than the rest of the Baltic states. But the Baltic is a very busy sea, sea for commercial and ferry traffic, and this will continue in time of tensions and war as well. It will continue in time of war as well. We have, should not forget that. Russia, with its oil refineries in St. Petersburg, for example, has a strong need for safe and secure sea in the Baltic Sea. And another point which has been mentioned today as well as a great priority is climate change and accepting the consequences and responsibility bordering the nations. And this topic, very important topic, is taken care of by the United, by, by, so, pardon, by the uh, European Union. But protecting the environment is one of the priorities, and we should not forget that. Safeguarding sea lines of transportation, undersea cables and undersea pipelines is a permanent and continuous task for coast guards, maritime police and naval forces. So this is something which need a close cooperation between the more civilian part and the navies. Therefore, cooperation between Coast Guard, Maritime Police and Naval Forces is urgent on a national basis, but between all bordering countries as well. This ensures secureness and safety for the critical maritime infrastructure. This includes harbors and wind parks and pipelines 
and the undersea cables. But the cooperation between the civilian part is done, it is exercised. And uh, we, we all know that the experience by these exercises on the civilian side between Coast Guard and police is working very well. Now we have, with the accession of Finland and Sweden, we have the naval part of both countries as well. Provide to provide deterrence with Sweden and Finland code capabilities, their knowledge of geography, including the seabed, is much more impressive. And both nations are providing options for excellent logistic hubs for NATO. And logistic is, I think, a very important part. If you look into the Ukraine, then it is one of the key parts which is now uh, forcing the Ukraine and us as well. And the island of Gotland has an increased possibility for logistic support towards Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. It makes a difference if a distance between Gotland and Latvia is only 200 kilometers or the long distance to Poland or to Germany. This offers a real alternative to the Soviet gap and to therefore increase strength the Baltic Sea. From a military perspective, we have to ensure both combined and joint thinking and planning. That does mean we have to combine military capabilities from Baltic nations and beyond. And I want to stress beyond. Uh, all nations are welcome uh, with their naval assets in the Baltic as often as possible. And we need a close coordination and cooperation between Army, Air Force, Navy and Cyber Forces. Securing the Baltic Sea is not longer a naval task alone it has, as it had been until 1990. It's now a part for all services, for Army, for Air Force, for Navy and for Cyber. In times of risk and tensions and war, we need a strategic command. The command must encompass all military capabilities. Up to now, it is the Supreme Allied Commander Europe in Mons Belgium. If, with a possible new Supreme Command Atlantic in Virginia, US, this could change. Maybe that some of the Nordic states have some sympathy with this change. But on the other hand, uh, we have to look into the possible developments in, in, in the United States, and therefore, I think we are well equipped with the uh, succour as far as it is now. But what we need is, in any case, uh, tactical command in the Baltic Sea, a fleet command which is able to command all the, and coordinate and command all the Baltic fleets uh, operating together. And I can tell you Germany is prepared to establish such a naval fleet command in Rostock with officers from all Baltic nations. And the center of excellence for confined and shallow waters in Kiel can support this very easily. But of course, there are other options as well. The Baltic Sea is not an EU or NATO sea or a flooded meadow, as some people from bigger navies are telling us. It is a sea with its own rights and conditions. But today, it is no longer a pure maritime area dominated by Navy and Naval Air Arms. It's a joint and combined area. A civil military approach is a precondition for safety and security at sea and ashore in times of tension and war. Joint and combined action, as I mentioned before, are very important. And uh, we have a lot of exercises in the Baltic Sea which needs to be continued now with the official presence of Finland and Sweden as well. But a clear and simple chain of command is very important. And therefore, uh, we have no time to discuss principal questions uh, about this issue, I think it, there is, time is not on our side, as we have heard today several times. If in the years to come the EU would achieve more military expertise, a new command would be very much welcome. And the EU is, EU is doing a lot in the Baltic Sea, but of course not so much in the military aspect. We have no time and we have to act now, and we have not a time to, for long principle discussions about competences and responsibilities. We have to secure the Baltic nations and the people living in the Baltic area by all available means. And we need 
and this is very important, and we compare this with the actual situation in Ukraine, we need to publish a simple narrative, a strategic communication towards our societies to achieve acceptance and better understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent Miro. So part of what you said related to structures and, you know, united command in the region. So this is why I turn now to, to you, uh, General de Roussier. Uh, you have this experience of being in Brussels, the French representatives to, to the EU and NATO. Um, how the, how the, the war in Crimea and the, war, the return of war in Europe, how did it change this, this debate? And, uh, and how do you see the place of the Baltic Sea and this region in this, in this new debate? Étant à Paris, bien sûr, je vais parler en français, parce que ça me paraît avoir une certaine logique, euh, sur euh, l'Europe de la mer Baltique. And, and so I'm going to I'll switch to French in a minute. Um, what unites us in the Eastern Sea, to you, the neighbors of the Eastern Sea Qu'est-ce qui nous unit, nous, au pays limitrophe de la mer Baltique Je crois d'abord, je vais vous donner un, un regard en effet personnel, les fruits de mon expérience. 2008 à 2010, où j'étais à l'OTAN et à l'Union européenne, 2008, euh, la Georgie, 2012-2016, où j'étais le président de la réunion des chefs d'état-major des armées européens et conseiller militaire euh, de deux hautes représentantes successives, Lady Ashton puis Federica Mogherini. 2012-2016 c'est donc aussi 2014 et donc euh, la Crimée. Qu'est-ce qui nous unit Eh bien, d'abord, on est partenaire depuis longtemps, partenaire solide, on est ensemble. On a une perception des risques qui devient maintenant une perception commune d'une menace avérée. Et de là, on en déduit des enjeux et des défis. On est partenaire ensemble. Cela fait des années et des années que l'on a des exercices, autant... Union européenne, bilatéraux, avec les pays limitrophes de la mer Baltique. Que des dialogues stratégiques ont lieu, que ce soit à Bruxelles, à l'Union européenne, ou à Ever, à l'OTAN, ou dans les capitales. Que des engagements opérationnels ont lieu de par le monde, dans le cadre de l'OTAN, dans le cadre de la PSDC, la politique de sécurité et de défense commune, en Afghanistan, dans les Balkans, en Afrique, en océan Indien, et donc tout ça pour dire que les structures militaires, la structure politique de défense et les structures étatiques sont habituées à travailler ensemble depuis longtemps. Alors bien sûr, je, de mon temps, si je puis dire, euh, la Suède et la Finlande euh, n'étaient pas membres de l'Alliance Atlantique, mais ils étaient membres du Partenariat pour la Paix. Et donc à ce titre, euh, on les retrouvait à chaque réunion, sur chaque théâtre où l'OTAN était engagé pour participer en tant que partenaire et donc échanger au niveau politique et au niveau de défense sur les sujets. Le Danemark, dont on n'a pas encore parlé, mais qui avait jusqu'à récemment une politique particulière vis-à-vis -vis de la politique de sécurité et de défense commune, donc l'opt-out, euh, a changé. Et qu'est-ce qui illustre tout ceci En fait, ces changements qui, à l'époque, euh, en bilatéral, j'en parlais, mais aux réunions, je n'ai jamais entendu, au niveau politique ou militaire, qui que ce soit, parler de euh, la rejointe de l'Alliance Atlantique par la Finlande ou par la Suède, ou de la fin de l'opt-out par euh, le Danemark. Le changement, c'est bien sûr que la perception d'une menace avérée a progressivement évolué, et je crois en effet que maintenant, elle est commune à nous tous, euh, par rapport à ce que vous disiez, Madame la Ministre, je crois que euh, jusque nos plus hautes autorités politiques, et le président de la République, bien évidemment, M. Le Drian, tout à l'heure, a bien, a bien évoqué combien, euh, oui, on a un adversaire. On a un adversaire. Donc une perception commune avérée, celle de la Russie, euh, parce qu'elle défie les souverainetés, les souverainetés de nos États. Et c'est une menace existentielle bien connue. Euh, des États baltes de la Finlande aussi. Et je me rappelle des échanges que j'avais en 2008, juste après la Georgie, pour ne parler que de cela, et, mais peut-être aussi euh, après la Crimée, euh, où euh, 
vos représentants m'ont éduqué sur ce qu'était leur perception et donc que j'ai pris en compte de plus en plus sur la, la Russie. Oui, c'est il faut montrer notre force et notre détermination. C'est un rapport de puissance qu'il faut avoir. Donc, menace existentielle bien connue, une menace avérée qui explique que la Suède a arrêté ses 200 ans de neutralité et que la Finlande, depuis que je suis né, était neutre, mais a changé récemment. Je crois que les discours du président Poutine, nombreux, très nombreux, la lettre du ministre Lavrov du 17 décembre 2022, où il vous engage à ne pas rejoindre l'Alliance Atlantique, sont des éléments qui ont bouleversé les autorités politiques. Et donc, j'en viens à un point opérationnel important, cette menace a été concrétisée par trois fois, et selon trois modes d'action différents. C'était tout d'abord la guerre hybride, le fait accompli, la fulgurance, c'est la Crimée en 2014, et je me rappellerai toujours l'appel du chef d'état-major ukrainien ce soir-là, qui m'appelle, comme il en a appelé d'autres, mais, euh, mais qui m'appelle pour que faire savoir ce qui se passait, que les petits hommes verts n'étaient pas tout à fait des petits hommes verts, et que des renforts arrivaient, nombreux, en dehors de la zone, en dehors de Sébastopol, et donc on, on était dans une invasion. Euh, et donc c'était pour que je prenne ceci en compte et que je puisse le relayer vers les chefs d'état-major des armées et surtout vers les autorités politiques à Bruxelles. Deuxième phase, c'est... Euh, Toujours la même année, 2014, fin d'année, le Donbass, avec de la manipulation, de la désinformation, du mensonge, de la présence de troupes américaines, euh, russes, dans le Donbass, et une déstabilisation intérieure. Et troisième phase, c'est la guerre ouverte, 2022, l'Ukraine, avec une invasion armée, un échec partiel, et maintenant une guerre d'attrition. Je cite ces trois modes d'action parce que c'est ceux qu'en tout cas dans la planification militaire, on prend en compte maintenant. Et donc les enjeux collectifs, c'est qu'il faut faire face à une menace existentielle diversifiée dans ces modes d'action. Et pour ça, il faut faire preuve de réactivité, de souplesse et d'adaptabilité. Et en gros, entre nous, entre vous tous, pays de la mer Baltique, et nous autres, j'y mets le Royaume-Uni et d'autres pays qui font ça, il faut passer de partenaires à la croisée, et c'est ce qu'on fait, à toujours des partenaires à la croisée, mais aussi chacun d'entre nous a une résilience nationale, c'est ce qu'on fait en France, et a une solidarité renforcée aussi. Et les défis sont nombreux. Les défis, c'est d'abord maintenir la nécessaire cohésion nationale, c'est-à-dire tout en ayant une montée en puissance militaire et en même temps assurer une relance économique. Ça veut donc dire faire une optimisation collective. Et là, le rôle de l'Union européenne est très fort. Encore une fois, quand j'étais à Bruxelles, les sujets de défense à l'Union européenne et dans la Commission étaient peu abordés, hormis l'industrie. Je ne vais pas dire tout ce qui a changé, vous le savez, mais ces dernières années, ces derniers mois, on est dans un bouleversement complet. Et les perspectives d'avenir sont aussi complètes. Donc on y voit l'importance du rôle que peut y jouer l'Union européenne. Le deuxième point, je, je suis un enfant de la guerre froide, la moitié de ma carrière, c'est la guerre froide, et on n'est pas du tout dans une guerre froide. C'est-à-dire que les menaces hybrides, les deux menaces que j'ai évoquées tout à l'heure, parmi les trois, ce n'est pas du tout le type de menace auquel on était préparé. On était dans un conflit qui pouvait aller vers la guerre. Et là, ce n'est pas du tout la même chose. Et je vais y revenir dans quelques instants parce que ça nous impose un certain nombre d'évolutions. Troisième point, c'est l'inégalité devant la menace. En effet, on n'a pas du tout la même profondeur stratégique. Nous, on est à 2000 km, nous, France, on est à 2000 km du centre de la mer Baltique. Euh, et vous êtes à la bordure avec la Russie. Donc, ça veut dire qu'il faut qu'on adapte nos et c'est ce qu'on a fait, hein, mais il faut adapter nos réponses. Les outils que l'on avait précédemment, que ce soit l'Union européenne, les groupements tactiques ou euh, la NATO Response Force, la force de réaction rapide de l'OTAN, sont très bien dans le cadre d'un engagement majeur, sont très bien dans le cadre d'une volonté de démontrer notre volonté politique de passer à un autre registre, mais en termes d'efficacité, dans les premières heures et dans les premiers jours, totalement inefficaces. 
Et donc, on s'est complètement réorganisé. Et l'OTAN que j'ai connu n'est pas l'OTAN de 2024. C'est profondément évolué. Il va devoir et il continue à évoluer. Et donc, je crois que ces défis, euh, elles imposent quoi Elles imposent d'abord une coopération entre l'OTAN et l'Union européenne très active, différente de ce qui existait avant. Il faut dépasser les clivages politiques qui pouvaient exister. Bien sûr, l'OTAN, c'est la défense collective. Bien sûr, il n'y a que l'OTAN, à ce jour, qui soit capable d'agir dans le cadre d'un engagement majeur armé. Parce qu'il y a de la redondance, parce qu'il y a de la possibilité de penser à l'avant, parce qu'il y a des effectifs et parce qu'il y a des capacités nombreuses, dont certaines provenant d'outre-Atlantique. Mais l'Union européenne apporte beaucoup de choses. D'abord, dans son article 42, qui est au moins aussi robuste, si ce n'est peut-être un peu plus, que en termes de contraintes vis-à-vis -vis des États membres ou de solidarité manifestée par les États membres, donc par rapport à l'article 5. Donc oui, si l'un de nos pays est engagé, on fera tout ce qu'il faut pour euh, venir en aide. Mais je crois que la coopération UE et OTAN, elle doit beaucoup avoir lieu dans les actions hybrides. Et c'est donc sur les plans de contingence face aux menaces hybrides qu'il y a un champ important de travail à effectuer, qui très certainement est en cours, mais qui est un changement par rapport à ce que l'on connaissait il n'y a que dix ans de là. La coopération entre le temps et l'UE, c'est aussi sur la mobilité stratégique. On a bien sûr, on avait oublié, on n'a plus oublié maintenant et ça fonctionne, mais on avait oublié la mobilité stratégique. De, de mon temps, on faisait des exercices réguliers de déploiement à travers l'Europe pour vérifier que les flux logistiques, les flux de munitions, qu'il n'y avait aucune, liberté, aucune difficulté sur la liberté d'action. Euh, on, on, on réapprend, on a réappris et maintenant on est, on est très, très efficace. Mais c'était un changement majeur. Ça prouve juste la réactivité de, tout, de toutes nos structures et nos, nos systèmes. De, ça impose quoi aussi euh, D'avoir une dissuasion vis-à-vis -vis de la Russie qui soit active et crédible. Et c'est ce qui se fait en ce moment, euh, de janvier à mai, avec euh, 90 000 soldats qui, sont, euh, qui vont être progressivement déployés, provenant des 32 pays euh, de l'Alliance Atlantique, avec euh, des déploiements initiaux qui ont déjà eu lieu, avec des flux logistiques, puis après des renforts qui vont venir euh, et des, des exercices euh, un peu partout, euh, que ce soit dans le Grand Nord comme euh, jusque dans le sud-est de l'Europe. C'est Steadfast Defender 2024, donc un très grand exercice qui rappelle euh, finalement les exercices euh, que j'ai connus dans mon, dans mon adolescence euh, et après, qui sont les exercices Rudy Forger, Reinforced Germany, qui se faisait régulièrement et qui avait pour objectif de vérifier que, que tout marchait bien et qu'on on, on avait tout ce qu'il qu fallait. Mais encore une fois, je reviens à ce que j'ai dit précédemment. Un des enjeux majeurs, c'est comment collectivement on va répondre à des menaces hybrides où, dans les premières heures, un pays est seul, complètement seul, parce qu'il euh, ben, faut réagir vite et après... Le deuxième acteur qui peut l'aider, ce sont ceux, les pays avec qui il a une coopération étroite au niveau politique, au niveau ministériel et au niveau défense. Mais les deux premiers sont les, les plus importants. Et puis euh, après, il y a les alliances qui viennent. Elles peuvent venir très vite, surtout si elles sont prépositionnées, ce qui est le cas maintenant. Mais la menace hybride est complexe à, à appréhender. D'où l'importance pour moi de cette coopération UE-OTAN. Voilà, je pourrais parler de, de plus tard de tous les engagements que la France fait dans cette région, mais je vais peut-être en arriver à ma conclusion, une double. Euh, D'abord pour évoquer ce que Joseph Borrell, donc le haut représentant, vice-président de la Commission européenne, euh, qui a succédé à Federica Mogherini, euh, a dit avant-hier au Conseil de sécurité de, de, des Nations unies, le monde est de plus en plus sombre. The world is getting darker and darker. Et donc, comment réagir collectivement pour ça Et 
Je terminerai par le discours du président de la République, un extrait du discours du président de la République à Stockholm, le 30 janvier de cette année, où il dit « Il est clair que la sécurité et la stabilité de la mer Baltique seront en jeu, ou du moins qu'il s'agira d'une zone géographique où nous serons collectivement mis à l'épreuve. » Voilà, qu'est-ce qui nous unit Eh bien, c'est une perception commune des enjeux et la volonté d'y contribuer. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you. So it's already an hour that we are uh, speaking. Uh, so maybe I will just um, uh, ask uh, one or two uh, more questions uh, to, to you, uh, to some of you, and then we will open the floor for the questions of the public. Um, I think that one specificity of Lithuania and Poland is that you don't see Russia from the same angle. I think you are the only country in Europe with Russia on the West, I mean, your border with Kaliningrad, and you're the only one with Russia in the north, uh, if I speak of Poland. I, I think when we speak about uh, the Baltic Sea, we need to address this question of, of Kaliningrad. So can you, can you say a bit more what it is to have uh, this Russian region uh, so close to your border in terms of security, preparation, and in the past cooperation, but now uh, defense... Uh, Uh, in uh, now and in the future. Thank you for the question, and I think uh, I have a very inspiring. I, I have been very much inspired by all the presentations here, and uh, so so first answering your question, like uh, uh, Kaliningrad uh, has always been uh, like. Uh, You know, like uh, it's an enclave of Russia in between <laughs> Poland and uh, Lithuania. So, uh, of course, Russia is putting a lot of attention to that enclave, uh, deploying uh, many capabilities in order to be able to move them uh, if uh, they need them to be moved. Uh, and we are very well uh, aware of uh, Kaliningrad, uh, uh, let's say, presence just uh, behind the border. And in all our threat assessments that are published yearly, annually, we're emphasizing this part. Also, we need not to forget the Belarus border. And uh, for instance, in 2021, we had a migrant crisis when Belarusians were uh, on purpose letting go migrants to Lithuania in order to cause some chaos. And then to come back to your point uh, that you noted about the hybrid. I mean, uh, the warfare in general has changed already. Everything what uh, we used to have uh, before, before Crimea, before Georgia, 2008, uh, uh, before the war that started in Ukraine, the rules of engagement are different now because uh, means of uh, threats are different as well. Cyber domain is here. Uh, cyber doesn't have any borders. We can be attacked uh, from any point of the world with the capabilities used not only by Russia, but uh, China is a strong, uh, strong uh, let's say, actor in this uh, area. Northern Korea, Iran, uh, then uh, also hybrid threats uh, like attacking uh, the critical infrastructure on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Uh, how do we perceive it? How we react to that? What are the decision-making uh, chain of command uh, when it happens? Uh, do we take it uh, as a threat? already posted on one of the members or we don't. So uh, these are the questions that we need to address uh, now, today actually. And we were addressing already in Vilnius Summit quite many questions. And uh, decisions that have been taken in Vilnius Summit, for instance, for the defense plans, uh, they were quite vocal and quite clear. But still, I think... Uh, We need to do even more. And uh, in my portfolio, I'm covering also defense procurement uh, and uh, 
cooperation with the defense industries. So I think this is also another topic uh, that you were as well partly touching upon. But uh, we need to ramp up defense production and defense development uh, of the industries because uh, it's not enough. I mean, uh, forget about peacetime uh, production. It's over. It's, uh, it's not enough. Uh, Ukraine is shooting out uh, how many rounds uh, every day? I think, uh, I don't remember now the numbers, but it was something like uh, uh, 7,000 uh, per day or something like that. I, I'm afraid to be mistaken. But all the, all the uh, capabilities that we have in place at this moment, even with our ramping up uh, uh, efforts, they are not enough. And uh, European defense industry strategy that uh, came out uh, just recently on the table. I think it's also a strong, uh, strong uh, input in order to uh, to boost our production. But I mean, now we will uh, discuss among the members. We will take some decisions, etc. We will distribute the money. Uh, after we will start the projects, it will take like what one year till we launch uh, something, put like digging the ground uh, to, to 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 build a factory. And uh, I know that theoretically, you know, it's it's easy to say, but difficult to say, to to do. So uh, so I think it's uh, it's not uh, only responsibility of the governments. But it's also a responsibility of the businesses that are participating in that, because uh, uh, the businesses that are investing into, for instance, uh, defense industries development, uh, they are also now uh, taking some advantage, I would say, from uh, from the boosting of the production. So that's why they need also to take responsibility in investing into production lines because the profit they will be sharing all together. So, I mean, that we all need to take risks at this moment because for the better future that we are going to leave to our children. Otherwise, if we are, you know, very in very long discussions, we might, uh, again, time is, uh, time is expensive. And then the last point, to come back to Sweden and Finland. I actually had in my notes that uh, I was going to say about Sweden and Finland and how it is important for them to be a part of NATO. But I need to say and to confess here that uh, in my mindset, Finland and Sweden were already kind of a part of uh, NATO because uh, before joining the minister's cabinet, I was uh, uh, working in NATO. And in all, all of the North Atlantic Council meetings, Sweden and Finland, they were equal members of the North Atlantic Council. The information has been shared uh, among them as well. And I'm very happy that uh, that we are reinforced. But I agree that it's not a closed lake. Uh, and uh, I'm not uh, so joyful and optimistic because the ships are still there. The submarines are there. The Gotland uh, Island uh, uh, is there. That uh, that uh, that uh, Russians are flowing around. Uh, uh, our critical infrastructure is being challenged quite uh, regularly. I would say that is uh, under the sea, and uh, yeah, and Kaliningrad is also there, and Russia is uh, putting the tactical uh, nuclear weapon, uh, waving with this uh, weapon to, to, towards all the Europe and towards all the world. And uh, yeah, and uh, that's why we need also to take a strong stance uh, because Russia understands only the language of force. I think you are very right. There is this move to weaponization of everything, so it means we need defense of everything uh, to phase that up. Um, and, and when um, you talked about moving of capabilities from Russia to Kaliningrad, they, they, they pass by the sea. Huh? They need to pass by somewhere. So basically they put the, the, um, the capabilities on boats, and these boats are going through 
the Baltic Sea, which is a free sea, as you uh, clearly explained, uh, um, and, and they, uh, they pass by your shores. So it's, uh, it's a clear uh, threat. So can, can you say something from the Polish perspective on, on Kaliningrad? Well, certainly, but I, I don't believe that Poland is the only country that actually borders Russia from the north. Uh, Sweden also has this very yeah. short gap. Yeah. Um, and I also actually c can only resonate what was already said by the, uh, by the minister, that uh, uh, Belarus in terms of security and, and the threat that it causes also to, to Poland, to Lithuania, uh, to other Baltic states is uh, uh, as equal as it would treat it as the Russian territory because of, uh, of uh, the deployments there and, uh, and uh, the fact that the Lukashenko regime is... Uh, in my opinion, at least from the security point of view, is not an independent state. So, so in that regard, we have a, a bit of a bigger border, longer border, and a lot of um, other issues on uh, on on um, uh, on our heads. Um, you know, when you look at the history since the 16th century, if I'm not mistaken, Poland uh, and Lithuania, by the way, because we used to be one country for for some time. Uh, we had a war with Russia every single 25 five years. And uh, the, uh, the time between 1944, 45, you may, if, you, if you count it like that, until right now, if you consider that we are in peace right now, is the longer time since the, uh, since the 16th century. But yet we consider Russia as, a, as an enemy, as a threat, military threat right now. And when I'm talking that we are spending 4% and 5% maybe in the next year, and when I'm saying that we should all actually have the same position, it is not because uh, you know, we all love playing with toy soldiers, uh, because I guess every single politician and every single think tanker and every single person that, uh, that thinks about life uh, differently than only you know, uh, by playing with the toy soldiers knows that we would prefer to spend this money on I don't know, health care. On, uh, on education, on many other uh, things. But the truth is that if you live in this part of Europe, the Russian imperialism is a very tangible threat that actually um, is aimed at, uh, uh, at, um, at um, scrapping us out of, out of every single thing that we consider the European prosperity, the European way of life. And in order to preserve that, and I guess the Ukrainians know it by heart right now, in order to preserve your identity, in order to preserve uh, your nationhood, you have to spend your money on defense because it's a very tangible tool in which you can actually fight with, with, your, uh, with your enemy that sits in the, in the Kremlin. Um, so if you take this perspective in your mind, then, the, then it, is, it is an obvious perception that you have towards, towards Russia. But when you sit here in Paris, um, uh, Take into account that actually the Russian imperialism right now is not only the Russian imperialism, it is the axis that was actually also mentioned by the minister, the axis of uh, Russia, North Korea, Iran, that causes a lot of troubles to, uh, to, to French interests also in Africa. And in that regard, it is not only you know, limited to the, uh, to the eastern border of, uh, of Poland, to the borders of, uh, of, of Lithuania or over any other country in the, in the Central and uh, Eastern Europe. And to conclude, if I may say so, uh, because we are referring to that as NATO Eastern flank all the time, but it is also European Union's Eastern border. So by spending this money on defense, by uh, sending strong towards Russian imperial threat, we are guarding and we are saving not only the NATO border, but we are also saving the prosperity and life of people here in the Paris, in the streets of Paris, and their, uh, you know, joyful life, if I may say so. Thank you.